Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Association of the United States Army's annual meeting and trade show in Washington, D.C. Our coverage here is sponsored by AM General, Elbit Systems of America, General Motors Hydrotech, L3 Technologies, and Leonardo DRS. And we've got with us Mark uh, Signorelli, who is uh, the uh, Vice President for Strategy and Business Development at BAE Systems, Platforms, and Services. That's it. It's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And even though I've interviewed you many times, I still end up getting tripped, uh, tripped over it. Thanks very much uh, for your time today. And also, it was great talking to you over in uh, DSCI, where um, you know we got it. You gave us a sense on where the the British uh, Britain's programs were. Um, let's talk here. You know, AUSA is always an opportunity. You know, you guys always have sort of the latest and greatest. Uh, yeah. uh, if I recall, last year there was an M109 uh, here, or a couple of years ago there was an M109 here, which was always uh, good to see. The Red Legs were happy with that. Amphi, obviously a very important program for you guys, a, a big win, and we talked to General Bassett about that uh, yesterday a little bit. Talk to us about what you guys are highlighting here, and I, I have a sense, Mark, I don't know, but I, I think this vehicle may be emblematic of some of the things you're trying to do. It is, so what's behind us here is uh, our mobile uh, short-range air defense demonstrator, uh, and what we've done here is taken a Bradley, standard Bradley A3, uh, and integrated a number of air defense capabilities on here. It's got a search radar, got a fire control radar, it's got a, a jammer, counter uh, UAS jammer, uh, a missile launcher, and a, a new gun that has a uh, proximity fuse munition. So, so we put all this together, high TRL components, uh, to give the Army a sense for what kind of capabilities they could get uh, to meet their emerging short-range air defense uh, requirements. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and, and so this is really sort of, like I said, emblematic. Uh, we're doing a very similar thing with our next generation Bradley that was here last year, uh, putting new technologies on that platform to help the Army figure out uh, what capabilities can they have in their next generation of vehicles. Uh, very much in line with what you heard the Chief talk about yesterday around uh, the combined task forces uh, and uh, uh, Modernization Command, trying to get the industry capability flavor into the Army's requirements. Um, what are um, some of the other things that you guys are highlighting and featuring here? Obviously the armored vehicle part is an important part of it, but what are some of the other things that you're talking to? Yeah, I mean this place has been a Washington Army leadership for the, for the past couple of days, like, like all, almost all of the leading stands. But talk to us a little bit about what are some of the other things that you're talking to them and what, what kind of feedback are you getting about that's going to help trim your sales as you guys go forward? And so we've got a number of munitions uh, capabilities that we're demonstrating here. Uh, APKWS, uh, Advanced Precision Kill Weapon Systems, uh, Bonus, uh, an anti-armor artillery round, a uh, guided mortar round, uh, and the hypervelocity projectile. Uh, all of those are munitions programs that sort of start to lead us into that next generation of lethality uh, for the Army and frankly for the uh, Marine Corps and Navy as well. Many of those programs are multi-service. Uh, also, uh, vision systems, uh, helicopter landing systems for obscured landing areas, uh, and, and, and always a focus with all of those, how do you integrate that capability to make platforms more capable? Do you, um, you know, we talk, we've talked about the GCV program, the Ground Combat Vehicle Program, that's now defunct, but it generated an enormous amount of technology. I want to sort of meld, you know, you guys are building lots of prototypes right now, as you sort of feel, and again, help shape how the Army thinks about things. And it is a time of investment. Almost every one of the companies here is talking about making an active investment in order to secure that position for the future. Talk to us about how some of that GCV technology that you guys helped develop some GCV technology that maybe other guys helped develop, mm -hmm. that you guys are thinking about integrating into your uh, systems and vehicles as, as time goes on, as, as you think about what that deep future looks like that you've got to position yourself for. So, GCV very much like FCS. The, the program failed, but the investments didn't. The technologies that come out of both of those programs are what we're putting using as the baseline for uh, capabilities, advanced, weld and protection systems, how we build vehicles, uh, electric drives, uh, the electrification of platforms. When you put that much kit on a vehicle, you need a lot of electrical power. The way to do that is by electrifying the whole vehicle. Uh, sensors that we developed for GCV are finding their ways onto uh, many of the platforms we have. And, and so there's just a whole range that, it, it's a shame when you lose a program 
it would be a much worse shave if you lost the investment. And that's what we're trying to make sure that we harvest uh, from our investment and our partners, right? There's a number of uh, partners that have invested uh, to help bring these capabilities. Um, let me ask you about uh, hybrid power. You guys um, are a commercial hybrid power uh, supplier. Um, you guys did have hybrid on your vehicle when you guys were uh, in the GCV program. Uh, well, they're one of our sponsors now, but General Motors Hydrotech is, is uh, and General Motors has announced that they want to go to an all, uh, all electric, all battery, fuel cell combinations uh, like that. It's sort of a zero emission fleet in, into the future. And the company is looking, especially in the defense space, to how do, how do we do that? Uh, and it's still a couple of years away. We talked to Charlie Fries. What, what future do fuel cells, hybrid power, you know, talk to us a little bit about it because this may not necessarily be the right application for it. That's much more of a vehicular thing. I think everybody recognizes that it has to be commercialized, commercially viable, and then make its way into the military space. But what do you see when it comes especially to the heavy vehicle side? What the role for fuel cells, for batteries, for hybrid power is, given that you need so much energy density coming out of this vehicle in order to just propel 38 tons across the road at high speed. So, so the core of our vehicle electrification is a hybrid uh, electric drive propulsion system. Um, it's highly efficient. Um, interestingly enough, we don't do hybrid electric for combat vehicles for fuel savings. We do it for performance. Uh, and the ability to integrate capabilities, the electrical power uh, is what it provides. Uh, the other interesting thing about hybrid electric is we don't care what the power source is. Today, it's typically a diesel engine that turns the generator. Um, when fuel cell technology is mature enough, uh, it's easy to plug fuel cells in. And, and the conversations we're having with, uh, you know, with General Motors and those folks is about when's the point when you're mature enough to really start talking about the kind of power density that we need. So, so we're keeping a close eye on that and in a dialogue. Um, but, and then on batteries, right? Battery technology, it's like your laptop, right? Every 18 months we're seeing significant changes in capability and capacity. So having the electrical architecture on the vehicle, the high voltage uh, allows us to be very agile in literally plugging and playing new capabilities onto these platforms. Something we've never been able to do. Bradley still has the same basic powertrain it did in 1981 when we fielded it. Uh, and, and we're talking about a, a revolution in the ability to update those kind of systems. Um, well, a last question, does the hybrid power give you different sorts of challenges for the crew, whether it's high voltage lines, whether it's batteries. I mean, are there safety issues associated with that um, as well? I mean, for example, with hybrid cars, uh, first responders were like, look, I mean, there are certain challenges when you go cutting through a car like this, and you know, lithium ion batteries have a, a, a history sometimes that when they do catch fire, it ends up not being a positive thing. Talk to us a little bit about what are some of the, you know, how you guys are thinking through that piece of the challenge. So our first venture into high voltage power is in the field with the M109A7 and the 992A3. Those vehicles have high voltage on them. Uh, and they really sort of led the way in terms of maintenance procedures, how do you train soldiers, uh, you know, how do you mark high voltage systems? I mean, orange cables. If it's an, Army's used to black cables, if it's orange, <laughs> Don't cut that one, right? Um, so we've done a lot of work around safety uh, and maintenance procedures to make them soldier safe. Uh, in terms of the batteries, uh, on GCV we had a, uh, a whole test regime around what happens when you overmatch one of those batteries and can you really control the fire and vent the system? And, uh, and I think we're able to show the Army, who had the same kind of concerns, uh, that it is safe and it is, you're able to do that. And so um, I won't say that there's universal acceptance, uh, but I think we're starting to get there largely because people see a lot of electric cars on the road, right? And so, well, if there's a car, why can't I have it on this? So. It's a, it's a maturing uh, environment, I guess right. I'd say. <laughs> Sir, thanks very much. It's always a pleasure Great. talking to you. Good to see you, Vago.